everybody. Welcome to the Symbolic Revolution during the Paleolithic period in Europe. Okay, so let's return to our two models for the development of behaviorally modern humans. As we talked about in Lecture 2.2, Stephen Mithen argued that the development of new types of intelligence and connections across these types of intelligence is what led to the symbolic revolution. Today, we'll dive into David Lewis Williams' shamanic model, which suggests that the development of human consciousness is what led directly to religion, art, and social hierarchy. According to Lewis Williams, the orthodox view of modern human consciousness entails abstract thinking, which refers to the ability to act with reference to abstract concepts not limited in time and space. It also involves planning depth, or the ability to formulate strategies based on past experience and to act upon them in a group context. This modern human consciousness is also behavioral, economic, and technological in terms of its innovation. And finally, it is a symbolic behavior. It refers to the ability to represent objects, people, and abstract concepts with arbitrary symbols, vocal or visual, and to reify or reinforce such symbols in cultural practice. In developing an alternative to this conventional model, Williams draws on three lines of evidence, neuropsychological, ethnography among San hunter-gatherers in Africa, as well as the archaeological record. In his ethnographic work with San hunter-gatherers, Lewis Williams found that San shamans had intense dreams and hallucinations produced by sensory deprivation during rituals in caves, and that during these rituals, they reproduced their visions in art. Lewis Williams argued that many Paleolithic images were also created as part of these kind of rituals and the recreation of visions uh, into depictions on cave walls. Furthermore, Lewis Williams has argued that the act of painting and engraving images was intended to evoke supernatural animal spirits seen during visions. Individuals who communicated with the spirit world were given power by animal spirits to solve human problems or make predictions about the future. These individuals are typically what we think of as shamans. Lewis Williams' argument is based on an understanding that we have a shared kind of neurological makeup across our co contemporary society as well as deep into the past that allows us to make comparisons between the modern brain and the Paleolithic brain. So it's these precise neurological similarities that allow us to take ethnographic examples from the San living in Africa today and apply it to people living hundreds of thousands of years in the past in Europe. So Lewis Williams' model places human consciousness on a spectrum from alert to autistic, think basically asleep. Along this spectrum, human, the human nervous system generates normal consciousness, what we're doing right now watching this video, hopefully, as well as altered states of consciousness. Altered states of consciousness are produced through isolation, rhythmic repetitive movements and chanting, intense concentration, and oxygen deprivation, which produces hallucinations. Neuro -like, neuropsychological studies of trance states have shown the presence of three overlapping stages in the creation of this altered consciousness. Stage one, entoptic phenomena. Stage two, construal. 
and stage three, hallucinations. So let's get into how each of these phases works. Let's start with stage one, entoptic phenomena. Entoptic phenomena refer to the process of seeing geometric forms and bright colors, and this phenomena is produced through light and oxygen deprivation. Many of you may have entered this state if you uh, try to stand up really quickly um, after you've just been sitting down and you might see kind of bright lights, little stars. That's the beginning of entoptic phenomena. Once one begins to see these bright colors and abstract shapes, the individual begins to enter into phase two, construal. In construal, geometric forms are imagined into objects of emotional significance based on the individual's social, religious, and cultural beliefs. So what you begin to see as you enter into stage two will totally depend on the cultural context in which you're living. Our ethnographic example of people in Africa, San hunter-gatherers, they probably see things that are quite different from those uh, people living in the United States who may enter into these uh, second phases of construal through, through oxygen and light deprivation. Williams describes the second stage as feeling like you are being drawn into a vortex or tunnel at the end of which is a bright light. On the other side of the vortex is a lattice derived from the geometric imagery produced in stage one. In the compartments of this lattice are the first true hallucinations of people, animals, and otherworldly beings. In the third phase of this intensified process, of diving into your subconscious, the individual enters into full-on hallucination. What the subject hallucinates in the third stage is culturally determined. For example, a shaman might see animal spirits, while a Christian mystic might see a saint. During stage three, the shaman spirit is believed to leave the body and can travel to the underworld or become one of their hallucinations itself. So to summarize, in stage one, you begin to see bright lights and abstract shapes. In stage two, those lights and shapes begin to form into recognizable figures. As one dives deeper into an altered state of consciousness, those figures become layered with cultural and religious significance, creating the types of anthropo anthropomorphic figures, like the bull man found at La Trois Frères, discussed in Lecture 2.2. According to Lewis Williams, the act of painting and engraving images in caves or on rocks was intended to evoke these supernatural animal spirits. Individuals who communicated with the spirit world were given power by animal spirits to solve human problems or make predictions about the future. But still, the question remains, why transfer such mental images onto the walls of caves to begin with? Why go through all of this effort just to paint pictures on a wall? While some Paleolithic rock art appears in visible, easily accessible areas of caves, most of it is found in small niches or chambers that were only accessible through long journeys. The secluded nature of these images suggests that they were part of a solitary practice only meant for privileged individuals, specifically priests or shamans. For Lewis Williams, the shaman arose during the Paleolithic as a new human protagonist in search of social power through the control over the spirit world. Williams argues that there are three tiers to the shamanic cosmos, 
the level of daily life, the realm above, and the realm below. The shaman is able to travel to the realm above and below and therefore serves as a mediator to the cosmos. The shaman in this context is then like the nexus for kind of divine power connecting these three worlds. The shaman gains control over the spiritual world through the neurological experience of the mind during altered states. He also gains control, or she gains control, through the creation of imagery and the sensuous experience in caves, which stimulated the experience of the mind during these altered states and produced the hallucinations that were then depicted in cave art. One of the most notable archaeological sites of the Paleolithic period where we can literally see Lewis Williams' model, shamanistic model play out, is Chavot Cave in France. Chavot Cave is one of hundreds of natural caverns cut into the pale limestone cliffs that form the Erdeshi Gorge. The cave itself dates between 32 and 24,000 years ago and is about 400 meters long with a vast network of chambers and more than 300 paintings documented within it, its, each chamber and boundaries. Chavot is littered with archaeological and paleontological remains including the skull and bones of cave bears, which hibernated in the cave, as well as the skulls of an ibex and two wolves. Stone lamps were used to illuminate the dark walls, and torches were smeared across walls to remove the charcoal. For example, the stone lamp depicted here, which includes an engraved ibex on it. These lamps would have been filled with grease and then with a wick made out of plant fibers lit and carried around the cave. Chavot is divided into two major sections. The first section includes images, the majority of which <clears throat> are painted in red, with only a few black or engraved images. Section two, the animals in this area are mostly painted in black. So we see a kind of clear concentration of images with black and engraved images being concentrated in section two and red images being concentrated in section one of the cave. Chavot, as I mentioned, was a bear cave, a place where these powerful animals hibernated. It has been suggested that human visitors to the cave came there to acquire the power of these large beasts. In addition to bear imagery, archaeologists found more than 30 intentionally placed bear skulls surrounding this, these slabs, creating a kind of bear shrine. The Chavot artists were masters of perspective. We see many examples of the overlapping heads of animals, which give the effect of movement as well as numbers. They, to do this, they would have spread the paint with their hands over the rock. Here's another example of the amazing types of perspective that were used within these cave depictions. So in this image behind me, you see horse heads drawn in profile overlapping each other. Many of the animals represented in Chavot were dangerous members of the late Ice Age. The most common animals throughout the cave are lions, mammoths, and rhinoceroses, which make up 63% of all the images within Chavot. This is actually a really huge percentage compared to later periods of cave art. Horses, bison, ibex, deer varieties, panthers, as well as owls are also represented in the cave. Here you see behind me some depictions of lions and panthers. 
These animals were rarely hunted. So images in Chavot of these animals are not simple depictions of daily life, animals that you would see roaming around the European uh, landscape. But rather, these animals were had a particular significance that was not tied to subsistence, but rather to more social and religious practices. So we can imagine that the depiction of these particular types of animals in Chavot re is representative of the idea that these animals were spirit animals or basically guides that would help shamans on their journeys. There's a, a third final recess in Chavot, and this is the kind of last and deepest chamber of Chavot, referred to as the Salle du Fon, and it's home to the depiction of what is called the Venus and the Sorcerer. Depicted behind me is the image of the Venus drawn in black charcoal on a vertical cone of limestone that hangs three feet from the cave's ceiling. What you can see in particular here is the pubic triangle which signifies the female Venus figure. And the legs of this figure are drawn in a kind of typical, with typical plump sides thighs rather. And we see this type of depiction of the female body in all sorts of statues that begin to develop around this same time. So we imagine that the depiction of the Venus within Chavot was part of a symbolic system likely linked to the celebration of female fertility and gender. The sorcerer is a half man, half bison figure, very similar to that, the, the imagery we saw from Le Trois Frères, and is actually painted over on top of the Venus figure so that the, there's a kind of selective destruction of the Venus's body. The location of this sorcerer signifies that this chamber was a privileged place only allowed only given access to, to particular people. According to Lewis Williams, during the Upper Paleolithic, caves were topographically equivalent to the psychic journey to the underworld, so that the cave actually mirrored the steps and processes of hallucination that I described earlier in the lecture. Outside the cave, you have daily life and waking consciousness. As you enter into the cave, you enter into stage one, where sensory deprivation begins. As you move deeper into the cave, you enter stage two, in which the shaman begins to construe figures out of abstract shapes. Finally, as one enters the deepest, darkest recesses where the sorcerer and Venus images are located, the shaman begins to hallucinate about the spiritual world in full. Lewis Williams argued that caves, like Chavot, were physical representations of the emerging social hierarchies that we see in daily life. These social hierarchies were centered around the struggle to control access to altered states and to restrict the type of imagery that different classes of people could make. So as you progress through the cave, you entered into smaller, more restricted areas. Large images of embellished chambers were probably communally produced. Smaller chambers further back in the caves, where only one or two people could fit, would be only for a select few. So access to these restricted areas would have been regulated by shamans. So again, you have these three layers, the physical cave, social relations, and human consciousness. Outside of the cave, it was least restrictive, open to the community, and represented the realm of everyday conscious life. Entrance of the cave would have been open to some individuals, 
and would have been associated with daydreaming and a light trance state. The far end of the cave would be the smallest and most exclusive area. Access to it would have been controlled by shamans and sensory deprivation would have been associated with full-on hallucinatory dreams. But the question remains, is there any evidence that social hierarchies were actually beginning to emerge at this time? Some preliminary evidence of social hierarchy comes from Dolne Vistanchet, a cave site in the Czech Republic. At Dolne Vistanchet, we have a campsite that's overlooking the Dai River Valley that, and dates to about 25,000 years ago. Roughly 100 people would have occupied this site during its height. What's really notable about Doni Vistancis is the large number of burnt clay figures which were fired in small oval-shaped ovens found throughout the site, as well as thousands of ceramics depicting animals. These ceramics represent the world's earliest evidence for fired clay. These burnt clay pieces also preserve traces of basketry and textiles made from plant fibers and provide the earliest examples in the world of these types of fiber technologies. In addition to a wide range of ceramics, Dona Vistanza contained the remains of a triple burial, a teenage female surrounded by two teenage males. Analysis of the female remains revealed a marked curvature in the spine, indicating that she was likely crippled. The two males were healthy and probably died in the prime of their life. The male on the right side was placed on his stomach, facing away from the female, though his left arm is linked with hers. Both men had necklaces of pierced canine teeth and ivory on their heads. The male on the left wore some kind of painted mask. Each, of, each head in this burial was covered in red ochre. Strikingly, the female's pubis was also covered in red ochre as well. So what does all this mean? These, these placed burials, these, this red ochre, these beads, So our best guess is that the woman died in childbirth, hence the use of red ochre on the pubis. The left male was likely a shaman, hence the mask. The male on the right was probably the woman's husband. The men were both likely killed following the female's death, hence the wooden pole in the left male coccyx. There's also evidence at Donovish Stancic of a 40-year-old woman buried under the scapula of a mammoth. She was associated with a fox pelt and also covered in red ochre. Her facial bones indicated partial paralysis of the left side of her face, which was highly significant because these deformations resemble one of the carved figurines found at the site. This carved ivory figure might represent the first example of portraiture and really contrasts with the abstract style uh, de of depiction popular during this time period. The red ochre and the remains of this female suggest that it was ceremonial in nature. The association of mammoth scapula and fox bones indicates that this person was likely of high status. Ultimately, the findings at Doni Vistanta offer concrete evidence for the differentiation of social status through burial practices.